Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our worship service as we gather together to praise God this morning for what he has done in our lives and as we listen to his words. And we also welcome our church family by the way of the internet, just to let you know there's going to be some special music I'm sure you'll really enjoy as these folks have a, a burden for sharing good God's news through music this morning. So let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer as we prepare our hearts for worship today. Father, as we come here this morning, we come from a very, very busy lifestyle, a very, very busy world. Calm our hearts this morning. Speak to us. Speak to our very own personal needs. And Lord, as we lift up your name before this lost and dying world, give us the courage to speak out, as we know that your day is coming when evilness and all that will come to an end, and you shall return. So Father, we look forward to that day. But Lord, we also pray for our loved ones that don't know you, that have yet to put their faith and trust in you. Father, we pray to that end. In Christ's name we would pray. Amen. Pastor Lou. Well, as we come to worship our God together here this morning, we certainly um, come with humble hearts, prayerful hearts, desiring to honor Him through the worship that He deserves. As we come together here, I want to read for us Psalm 114 that's fitting for us in our study today. Psalm 114, it says, When Israel went out from Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange language, Judah became his sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea looked and fled, Jordan turned back. The mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. What ails you, O sea, that you flee? O Jordan, that you turn back. O mountains, that you skip like rams, O hills like lambs. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob who turns the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a spring of water. We certainly serve a mighty God who is able to do all those things and more. And as we come to sing this morning, we're going to be starting with our first hymn at uh, hymn 185, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, and we're actually going to have the chimes, the BK ringers, um, help us out here with singing this this morning. So if you would stand with us, as we sing together hymn 185, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, thank you for your singing. You may be seated. And thank you, Ringers, for coming to share in music with us this morning. Um, certainly, I hope you were blessed as we worship together along with the chimes this morning. And as we join together here in this sacred gathering, coming together as a body of believers, I'll tell you, I have been just encouraged lately. Um, I've had opportunity to share in a number of discussions, be it at First Fridays or getting together with local pastors on the side, um, different folks from different congregations, as well as our own, hearing what God is doing in our midst. Be sure today that God is at work here in Oxford. Certainly at times it can be discouraging for us. We may struggle to see those small ways even that God is working here in our midst. But I don't know, me as your pastor, I'm encouraged because I see God doing things that maybe we don't even fully comprehend. And so we can take heart in knowing that above our own comprehensions, God is at work and He is doing great works here in the town of Oxford. And as we come together for a time of prayer this morning, I would encourage us to spend a few moments now praying for the work that God is going to be doing here starting today and then in these days ahead. You've heard us mention that we're going to be having our VBS later this summer. A lot of work is going into that, and hearts, I believe, are being prepared for what God is going to do that week. We've also had opportunities to to go out on First Fridays, and and I was encouraged this last Friday by the conversations we were able to have, seeing different folks have an opportunity to hear the gospel message who perhaps maybe hadn't even been confronted with it before. And so now, as we quiet our hearts before the Lord in a few moments of silence, let's lift up prayer requests before God, specifically now, today, for the work that He is doing here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. Let's pray together, if you would, personally, and then I'll close this in a time of prayer together. Let's pray. Lord, as we come before you this morning, we're encouraged knowing that you are hearing our prayers, Father. We've talked time and time again about how much power you've placed in our prayers, Father, that you hear us, you work through them, and for that we praise you because we know that we're meek, we're frail, Father, and we're here but for a time, but yet in your grace to us, you've chosen to use us to accomplish your will. And so we praise you for that. Lord, as we join here, we think of the many opportunities we have ahead of us to share your gospel, and even those that we've just recently had. Lord, we pray that you would be preparing hearts as we look ahead to our VBS later this month. God, so much work is going into it, but we know that if not by your hand, that all those things will fall flat. But we're doing these things because we know that you work through us. So, Father, I pray for each of the workers who are involved in making this happen, Lord. Encourage hearts that the work that's being done is not void, but rather, God, that you are doing great things in each of the tasks that's being accomplished in preparation for that VBS God, we rejoice in you and in knowing again that you use us. And so, Father, I thank you for each one that has stepped up to be a part of that work for those few days of VBS. 
Lord, we pray that you would be preparing hearts, the hearts of each of the children that is going to come. Father, might you be at work in them even now that they would be receptive to your word, that they would hear your word with openness, Lord, and that they would ultimately come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's our desire. Father, we know that it's only by your will that that can occur. And so we lift it before you, praying that your will would be done. God, we pray for our church here in Oxford as we look towards all of the things that you're calling us to do, to just simply, ultimately, though, be faithful stewards of your word. Father, I pray that you would strengthen us by it, that you would give us a faithfulness in it, that we might not stray from standing firm on the foundation of truth you've laid before us, but God, that we would go unwaveringly, seeking to make your word known in a world that is largely opposed to it. God, may our hearts be strengthened and encouraged in knowing that there are other faithful workers in our community who desire to save. And God, may we not, as we said, waver, but instead stand firm, knowing that your word is true and that it endures forever. God, this morning as we come now singing songs of praise, desiring to glean from your truth, and ultimately then later coming to your table to share in a time of communion. Father, I pray that you'd be preparing our hearts even now. Purify us as we come before you. May our songs and our study and our remembrance this morning be a sweet and savory offering unto you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning, as we continue our study in Zephaniah, um, Zephaniah chapter 1, I invite you to stand. We're going to be reading four or five more verses here out of Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 14 to 18. Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 14 to 18. Read along with me here, and if um, you'd like, you can look in your bulletins for the Pew Bible number. Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 14 to to 18. It says, The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the Lord, of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord and the fire of his jealousy. All the earth shall be consumed for a full and sudden end. He will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. As we prepare to study this passage together, I invite you to sing with us in preparation for this morning's message, hymn number 193, Jesus, Thy Blood and Righteousness.
seated. And children, you guys are dismissed for junior church. <clears throat> As we come to the Word of God this morning, I'd invite you to just bow with me for a few moments together in prayer, coming humbly, asking God to speak to us here this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you now for this time. Lord, as we prepare to hear your word, I pray that ultimately your words alone would stand, that you would take all of mine away, God, and that you would be honored by the proclamation of your truth. Father, that you would allow for it to rest deeply in our hearts, that we might cling to it and live by it as we seek to be transformed by your living word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning, as we continue our study in Zephaniah, um, we're kind of going to be piggybacking a little bit off of what we talked about briefly last week and then going into it with a little more detail. One of the things for us this morning as we reflect <clears throat> on the day in which we are living is that it often seems as though the wrath of God is something that is maybe watered down a little bit. We see that. Amen. When we look around us, we see people, especially maybe this month, oft proclaiming that God is a God of love. And in some ways, that becomes something that they separate from the same God, who is also a God of wrath. Both these things characterize our God, but they should not be separated. The wrath of God and the love of God are both who God is, our holy and just God, but we would make a great error in assuming that the God of, maybe you've heard before said, the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament. That's a, an error in doctrine, most certainly, and something that leads to a lot of misunderstanding, and perhaps even that H word, heresy. We think about our God, we need to make sure that while we understand absolutely that He is loving, for if it wasn't for His love, There'd be no reason for us to gather here today. If it wasn't for God's love, there would be no sacrifice in Jesus Christ. There would be no redemption by his blood. But if it wasn't for the wrath of God, we'd be missing out on a large portion of the danger that is at hand today as men and women walk aimlessly through life, assuming that there is no consequence for acting in wickedness. The wrath of God is something that is seen here vividly in Zephaniah chapter 1, specifically this morning, verses 14 to 18. In our study in Zephaniah, it has become abundantly clear that God's judgment upon his people Judah was given decisively, without recoil. God was decisive in his judgment. And from it, we said last week that there would be no doomsday prepping. From God's judgment, no man could hide. God is not able to be hidden from. And His act of divine judgment, He has made clear here in Zephaniah that the wickedness of His people was putrid. His name was to be honored, and his name alone. And so as Judah was awaiting this judgment, you'll remember from last week, we said that as we looked in verse 7, God says, be silent. Be silent. Judgment is coming. Await it patiently, but know assuredly that you cannot escape what's coming. These people that Zephaniah spoke to, the people of Judah, were given surety that it was not far off. God's judgment was coming, and it was coming quickly. In fact, 
if there's any of you history buffs out there, we know from history that based on the estimated time of Zephaniah's writing and then what we know of Babylon's invasion, it's likely that the coming judgment that's spoken of here in our passage would have been seen in less than 20 years from the time of its proclamation. 20 years. How quickly does 20 years go by? Phew, fast. Yeah. I've heard that. Most of the people who received this message would experience the vast turmoil that the judgment would bring. And for those who would see its arrival, they would surely not be filled with joy. The reception of this judgment would bring, as we see here in our passage this morning, bitterness in their mouths. They would know the turmoil that was invading the land, and if God's sovereign judgment of Judah was to be coming, and it was, then we could be sure that not even the mighty would be able to stand. Look with me here in verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near. Be sure not only is it near, but it is hastening fast. It's coming quickly. And that day will be sure it's not going to be received with party hats and kazoos. I don't know, Carl, you getting any of those out today? Party hats? Not today. All right. No. This day of wrath, of judgment, would not be received like a party. Instead, it says here that the mighty man would cry aloud on this day of judgment. The battle preparations would not matter. The mighty men who long readied themselves for war would stand no chance against the judgment of the Lord that was coming. No battle could be won against God's hand. And those who were mighty would cry out for the judgment that had fallen upon them. I want you to kind of think in contrast to what we've read elsewhere in Scripture of the holy wars that we see. Those holy wars being those that God worked through the nation of Israel. Many times we're encountered with passages of Scripture, accounts, where we see God saying, the battle is mine. I'll fight for you. I'll go before you. And it won't be by your hand that you'll win this battle. It'll be by mine. You can probably think of many stories throughout the Old Testament where we see that. Maybe there's some that come to mind. I think of Gideon, where God kept whittling down the number until it would be sure that it wasn't man who was winning this battle. It was God. Or maybe Joshua on the walls of Jericho, where the people were told to march and march. God won that battle. It wasn't by man's hand that those battles were won. Israel was being held, taken care of by the God who went before them and fought for them. Yet here in our passage this morning, something changes. God was no longer, for at least a time, going to be using his nation to bring about judgment on those surrounding nations. Judah had found herself in a place where now God was using Babylon as the instrument of judgment for his holy war. This is terrifying. Think about Judah this morning. All these years, certainly they had heard the accounts of God working through his people, and now it switches. The great day of the Lord, this day of judgment, was near. And not even the mightiest of mighty of the nation of Judah would be able to stand. No, they would be crying out, broken down, certainly shedding tears for the judgment that had now come upon them. The nation of Judah could be sure the tide had turned. And they only had themselves to blame. 
They had acted in wickedness. God was long-suffering time and time again. If you think about the nation of Israel, perhaps the most common thing that you think about is, man, they just could not get their acts together. But yet God still fought for them. And now, now, those who God used as an instrument to bring about His purposes, this nation that He had protected and long cared for, would find themselves under the knives as well. God's judgment was now falling upon them, and the nation that He would use to bring about this holy war would not be His people but would rather be a foreign nation that would bring judgment upon those who, Michael, how's Michael in here, represented God poorly. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning. God takes great offense when his people misrepresent him. He doesn't take it lightly. And Judah had done that for long enough. So now judgment was falling upon them. Verse 15, a day of wrath is that day. A day of distress and anguish. A day of ruin and devastation. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Be not mistaken that as these people awaited their punishment, there was a clear depiction of what was coming. This is not a sugar-coated picture of potential circumstances. No, this day of wrath was coming and it was, as it said before, hastening fast. And this was not just any wrath that was falling upon the people. Nahum, how many times have you read Nahum? Chapter 1, verse 2 says this, The Lord is a jealous God, an avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. Consider how great Judah should have feared this day of judgment. In these moments, they would come face to face with the wrath of God. He was not only bringing judgment, but bringing upon them personally. Such wrath was going to bring about, as we read here this morning, distress and anguish, ruin and devastation, darkness and gloom. Let me just kind of appeal to you this morning that this is more than even your mind and my mind can probably comprehend. The wrath of God was falling upon Judah. This is not the place that you want to be. I would much rather, I don't know, I I think I know, fall under Chuck's wrath than God's. But the nation of Judah found themselves directly in the crosshairs of God's divine judgment. What a scary place to be. And this... I think also calls us to remember what we read in the New Testament. An important doctrine for us about what happened when Jesus Christ died for the sins of man. 1 Peter 2, you can turn there if you'd like, verse 24. 1 Peter 2, verse 24. Speaking of Jesus Christ, it says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Now, where does this fit into our passage here this morning? Understand this morning that as Judah awaited the wrath of God, this is the same wrath that you and I deserve because of the states of our fallen heart. The New Testament, specifically here, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, tells us that God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, 
to bear that wrath for us. Jesus Christ, when he went to that cross, took the wrath of God upon himself. These things that we are reading in Zephaniah chapter 1, God's hand pouring out against his people in judgment is the same thing that you and I deserve, yet Christ, because of what we said, remember wrath and love go together, because of his love for you and I, bore that wrath on the cross. He took the full brunt of God's wrath and bore it so that we might have life, paying the ultimate price without question for you and I. There's a cool theological term you can use for that. It's called penal substitutionary atonement. Look that up when you get home. Essentially, penal substitutionary atonement says that God sent Jesus to do that very thing, that Jesus, when he died on that cross, he bore the wrath of God, the wrath that you and I fully deserve to bear. He bore it. That's essential for us. And and let me tell you this morning that that's something that not everybody wants to hear. In fact, it's under attack even in Christian circles today. So you sit there and go, well, I won't ever need that. I won't need to understand that. Well, you will because believe me, it's crucial to the faith. Our understanding that when Jesus went to die on the cross for our sins, that he bore the wrath, wrath as such, we see here in Zephaniah chapter 1. And remember I said earlier that the people of Judah surely had to be fearing this wrath that was falling upon them. That's no place to be in the eye of God's coming judgment and wrath. But thanks be to God that Jesus bore it for us. So long as we put our faith and trust in him. Continuing on in Zephaniah chapter 1. Verse 16, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. All would be vulnerable to the destruction that God was bringing upon his people, Judah. No fortified city could stand against the awesome wrath of God. There would be no hiding, no tower could be built that would be strong enough for man to stand against that which was falling upon them by the hand of God. These people, Judah, had sinned wickedly, but be sure, so have we, that God in his infinite mercy to us has provided a way that we would not have to bear his wrath. Satan has been hard at work looking to tear down man's picture of God's wrath. He's caused many to look at it in a muted way. In their minds, they build up fortifications that they believe can defend against the sovereign creator. Man's perceived intellect is viewed as a means for which triumph can be had over the God of the universe. Men even now are building up supposed fortified cities in their minds, believing that knowledge of science and things like it can defend against these crazy Christians. We can be sure this morning that no lofty battlement will stand against the wrath of God. When we share God's message of good news, of hope, of penal substitutionary atonement, that Jesus bore the wrath that we deserve, be sure that many who we speak to are building up lofty battlements. But God here is clear. And against his wrath, 
No lofty battlement will stand. No tower can stand against the coming judgment. In God's judgment, He is able to bring, as we see here in verse 17, distress upon men. We have here a depiction of men walking aimlessly as if they are unable to see. Judah had done wickedly in the eyes of the Lord, and now God's judgment would come against them in a way that would confuse those fortified minds. Verse 17 speaks of blood being poured out in such abundance that it's like the dust of the ground. The flesh of those under God's judgment would be massacred as if it was excrement, dung. All would be laid waste that does not find itself hidden in the Lord God. Verse 18, neither silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord. In the fire of his jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed for a full and sudden end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. I want us to kind of understand what this is describing here for us. Historically speaking, a lot of times what would happen in ancient culture when a nation was being invaded, sometimes you could maybe pay off the invaders. If a nation came out against you, perhaps you could find enough silver and gold to make them go away. But God declares here in verse 18 that there would be no payoff. God could not be bribed or dissuaded by man's silver or gold. Those things cannot deliver from the wrath of God. And then it says, for a full and sudden end, he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. Now, it probably causes you to sit there and go, wait, what's this talking about? Because here in verse 18, we see that all the earth shall be consumed. All the earth's inhabitants will meet a full and sudden end. Well, wait a second. It wasn't all the earth that faced this judgment here in Zephaniah specifically. So what is this talking about? Well, there's a few points of view on this, and I'm going to kind of leave it to you, but I want to put them before you in understanding what was being referred to in verse 18 when Zephaniah, when God through Zephaniah says that all the earth would inevitably face this judgment. One belief is that this is referring to all the territory of Judah. When we go back and look at the Hebrew language, the word all the earth there can sometimes mean territory. Perhaps this was just referring to all Judah facing this judgment. The second thought is that this could potentially be giving us a, Dave, a segue, a segue into what we're going to read next week. when God declares judgment on Judah's enemies. Third idea here, perhaps maybe the most plausible, is this is also foreshadowing the coming judgment that still lies before you and I. That there is, as we see sometimes with prophecy, there is an immediate and then there's a future. Um, and we're going to see that as we continue this study I'll leave that to you in your personal study because the, the point for us here this morning is that God's wrath, His judgment cannot be hidden from apart from the salvation that we find in Jesus Christ. And there's two things as we consider this passage this morning that I want us to spend a little time reflecting on when we think about personal application of what is taking place here in Zephaniah chapter 1 verses 14 to 18. If you look there in verse 18, there is a word, jealousy. In the fire of his jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. 
As we consider the day of the Lord and the judgment that was coming upon Judah, we ought to consider this and the necessary worship of our God. Deuteronomy 4, 24 says this about our God. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. We've spent some time actually studying this on Wednesday nights. Our God is a jealous God. Exodus 34, 14. You shall worship no other God. For, that's a lowercase g. For the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Understand here that our God deserves and desires every ounce of our adoration, affection, and praise. And the people of Judah had defied that. They made idols and worshipped things that were made by human hands. They worshipped, as we've said, the creation rather than the Creator. The Lord is fully deserving of every bit of praise that we can offer up, and He's jealous for it. Not only that, but in His jealousy, He is jealous for that which is rightfully His. When we give praise to any other, we steal from our God that which is rightfully His. Our God is a jealous God. Now, this offers you and I this morning an opportunity to recalibrate, to think maybe even deeper about what it means to give God every ounce of the praise that he is jealous for because it was in part Judah's lack of offering of praise fully to the one true God that brought about this judgment. This is a moment for us to recognize that there is never a moment in our day that we should not ascribe to the Lord. Not one second that does not belong to Him. You say, well, wait a second. What about when I want to go do fun things? God is deserving of everything. God doesn't want us to not have fun, but we are called in Scripture to do all things for the glory of God. Our days should be fully fixed around the worship of our Lord. Our homes, our family's days should have routines surrounding rightful worship that we would make it a specific focused effort to ascribe to God the praise that is due his name. Why? Because he deserves it and he is jealous for it. Now be sure this morning, this is something that I struggle with too. But I'll tell you, this has kind of been something Ashley and I in our own home, we've been trying to work on. How can we ascribe God the praise due his name in every single moment of our day? Be sure that it is possible. And that doesn't mean that you should get out your Bible when you're driving and look. Don't do that. All right. I think you could probably get pulled over for that. Does that count as a handheld? Certainly in Delaware and Maryland, right? I'm learning our area. God deserves every aspect of our day, every ounce of our moments, every minute that we breathe is His, not ours. He's given it to us as a gift, so we ought to use it to sing praise to Him. And there are ways to do that. I'll tell you right now, one of the ways we are trying to do that, clunky in our home. It's been clunky. We're working at it. We've been trying to make time for family worship. As much as possible, I fail often. We tried it this week, and I think we got two in. We'll try for three next week. We fail. We fail so many times. But every aspect of our day, every bit of our homes, should be centered around giving our jealous God the glory that is due Him. Secondly, we've been talking about the wrath of God. 
In response to man's idolatry, God's wrath is being prepared. John 3.36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. And whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. As we said last week, protection is in Jesus Christ. But in saying this, let us also remember that wrath that he endured on the cross. Let us not downplay the wrath of God, but recount it with great trembling, recognizing that you and I also deserve the punishment that the people of Judah were about to receive. Let us not downplay the wrath of God, but instead look at it in recounting the reality that through Jesus Christ, he has saved us from it. Jonathan Edwards, a popular theologian from the Puritan era, said this, The bow of God's wrath is bent, and the arrow made ready on the string. And justice bends the arrow at your heart and strains the bow. And it is nothing but the mere pleasure of God and that of an angry God without any promise or obligation at all that keeps the arrow one moment from being made drunk with your blood. The wrath of God is severe. And for those who do not find life in Jesus Christ, it is coming and hastening fast. We would do well to recognize the wrath of God is being suspended here and now, but that one day it will come crashing down against all those who practice unrighteousness, who are not found in Jesus Christ. The wrath of God should cause us to fall on our faces, pleading for Him to spare us. And in this, we can also have confidence that His wrath has been spared only because of Jesus Christ, not because of anything we can do but because of the work that Jesus Christ did in bearing the wrath of God on the cross. As we consider the punishment that Judah endured, I want us to understand that what this judgment was should have been the same for us. The people of Judah here deserved every bit of what they received, and more so, we deserve it too. You and I deserve to receive a wrathful judgment for the wickedness that is in our hearts and the sins that we have committed. But this points us to the glorious work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He endured what Judah went through and more. He endured the wrath of God and was put to death so that you and I might have life and have it everlasting. And today... As we think about the wrath of God, God's judgment against a wicked people and the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ, we do it on a special Sunday. Certainly every Sunday is special, but today we come to the table to remember that sacrifice that Jesus paid. He gave himself so that in him we might have life and have it abundantly. And this is no small thing. Judah herself endured immense consequence, so much so that Scripture tells us that her blood was going to be poured out like dust. The wickedness of Judah has brought divine wrath to their doorstep, and so should have been true of us. When we consider this prophecy found in Zephaniah 1, let it draw us near to God, yes, maybe in a little bit of fear and trembling, but also in thankfulness that because of Christ's work, we do not have to endure what Judah endured. Their wickedness brought that divine wrath. But in fear and trembling, we also recognize that salvation comes through Christ alone, that we no have to longer bear the brunt of this punishment. Praise God! that we don't have to endure that. Praise God that he gave of himself so that we might be redeemed and draw unto himself every bit of glory that's due his name. When we consider God's jealousy and God's wrath, let us understand that we can do it also with an understanding of God's love involved in that. 
God is jealous for every bit of praise we can bring him, and he deserves it. And for those who make idols, who do wickedness, that wrath of God is coming. But ultimately, because of his love, he has provided a way of escape that is sure and true and unfading. That in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So when we recount the wrath of God here in Zephaniah chapter 1, let us not do it without remembering that you and I have been given a hiding place in our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we don't have to endure these kinds of torments forever, certainly, maybe temporarily, but not forever, because our hope is secure in our Savior, Jesus Christ, because of what he did in dying on the cross for our sins and then rising again from the grave victorious over sin and death. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, O Lord, we ascribe to you the glory due your name. We recognize that we are sinners. Father, that so often we do not give you the praise that you deserve. For that we ask that you would forgive us, but God, in that we also remember that our salvation is immovable and unshakable in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you for that gift of grace that you've given us through our Savior. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, as we prepare now this morning for a time of remembrance, remembrance of that gift of grace given to us by Jesus Christ, I invite you to stand in preparation to come to the table, the communion table, with hymn number 206, There is a Redeemer. Please stand.